And hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to begin talking about the planets. Uh, this will be divided into two parts. Today will be the terrestrial or Earth-like planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then next lecture will be the Jovian planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, plus a little bit about dwarf planets like Pluto. So, but today will be the terrestrial planets, and um, so we're going to do them in order. This is a picture of Mars, just, just for fun. Uh, we'll come back to this picture because there's some interesting stuff going on here, most notably this valley here, these volcanoes over here. Uh, but we're going to do them in order, and Mars is in first. So let's start with the first one, and the first one is Mercury. Um, Mercury is a fascinating place, and um, until very recently, we did have a satellite orbiting Mercury named Messenger. Uh, it ended its mission on time and having accomplished everything that it wanted to accomplish. Uh, and so one of the things we have now, though, are some really nice, uh, very, very high-resolution photographs of the surface of Mercury. Um, it looks a lot like the moon. I mean, it's a rocky, cratered body. So, you know, I could tell you that was the moon, and you would believe me. Um, so, uh, but it's Mercury. Now, the interesting thing here that we're, we're getting uh, are these wrinkles. You don't see those uh, on the moon. Uh, here's another picture uh, showing this, this wrinkled structure running down through here. Now, whatever it is, it happened after that crater and before that crater. So, these, are, these could be fairly recent features uh we think that we think that mercury might be actually shrinking a little bit and this is causing uh what a geologist would call reverse faulting um on the surface of mercury uh and so it's a uh, kind of an interesting thing uh going on there so we have some very interesting things that we know and some very interesting questions to ask uh still about mercury um uh craters on the moon are named for famous scientists craters on Mercury are named for famous musicians. This big one here is Beethoven. Uh, you got to be dead to get a crater, so it's all dead musicians. But uh, but uh, I just I just think it's kind of fun that they're they're named after famous musicians. Um, and so here's the um, here's the bullet points on Mercury. So so um, it is the closest planet to the sun. Uh, as you're memorizing those astronomical units, which you want to do, go ahead and round that up to point. Four, okay, um, so it is the closest planet to the sun at 0.4 AU's. It is also the smallest planet um, by far. Um, um, there are moons going around other planets that are larger than Mercury. Okay, <laughs> Titan uh, that orbits Saturn is bigger than Mercury. Um, but Mercury is pretty small. Uh, like I said, it's smallest planet, only about 3,000 miles across. Um, it only reflects about 6% of the sunlight that hits it. Now, I know that seems like an odd statistic. Like, why would I tell you that? Um, because here's the trick. Sunlight that is reflected is not turned into heat. And so what that means is that 94% of the light that hits Mercury gets turned into heat. And so consequently, daytime temperatures of about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Still not the hottest planet in the solar system. That will go to Venus here in just a minute. Um, but here's the trick. Mercury really doesn't have an atmosphere. I say very thin. It really, I mean, what I mean here is that Mercury is so close to the sun that the radiation and solar wind coming off of the sun is actually breaking down the rocks on Mercury. And as they break down, they release a little bit of gas. It doesn't really count as an atmosphere. So really, Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. Um, and so consequently, there's nothing to trap that heat. Um, and so the nighttime temperatures go down to negative 283. So it's not so much that mercury is hot, it's hot and then cold and then hot and then cold and then hot and then cold, but not all that quickly. Um, mercury spins pretty slowly, only about, it takes about 59 Earth days for mercury to spin through one side real day. So one 360 degree spin, okay? But here's the trick. Um, it only takes Mercury 88 days to go around the Sun. 
So because it has such a slow rate of spin and such a, you know, um, I mean, it barely spins faster than it takes it to go around the sun. And so a solar day on Mercury is 176 Earth days, right? The difference between a side reel and a solar day on Mercury is huge, right? Um, remember that on the Earth, it's only like four minutes difference between a solar and a side reel day. On Mercury, it's 59 versus 176 Earth days. So, um, so it's a, it's a huge difference on Mercury uh, between a solar and a side reel day. And once again, that's because it only takes Mercury 88 days to go around the sun and 59 days to spin. So that same side is almost locked, right? That same side of Mercury is almost always facing the sun. Not quite, but almost. Okay, so Mercury is a fascinating place, but in an era of, you know, NASA doesn't have an unlimited budget. It really has to set its priorities. Um, and right now the priority, and I think rightfully so, is, you know, looking for water and looking for life and so mercury that's not a thing on mercury it's just it's just really not so we're going to move on um and we're going to move on to the next planet out and that's venus um see how venus is kind of fuzzy right that's because venus has an atmosphere uh, an atmosphere that is 92 times thicker than ours so it has an atmosphere. Whenever you see a picture of a planet or a moon in space and it looks fuzzy like this, that's because it has an atmosphere. It's not some sort of artful, you know, let's make it look fuzzy because it looks good. It, it, it has an atmosphere. Um, now, um, Venus is the first of three planets in what we call the Goldilocks zone. <laughs> and uh, this is the zone where it's not too hot and it's not too cold for there to at least in theory be liquid water on the surface okay um and and that is just in terms of distance from the sun right nothing else things can change on a planet uh because you know and, and they obviously do but if you're just thinking about distance from the sun there are three planets in our solar system in the goldilocks zone and that's venus earth and mars okay now of those three, the only one that actually has liquid water is the Earth, right? So there's more to it than distance from the sun. But if you're looking for water, that's the first thing you think about. Um, Venus is um, about 0.7 AUs from the sun <clears throat> and is about the same size as the Earth. Uh, and so that means that when people really start looking around for other life maybe in the solar system, Venus was a prime target because it's in the Goldilocks zone, it's about the same size as the Earth, and all these clouds, right? So people were like, maybe there's something, you know, underneath those clouds, right? In the, ab in the absence of, of actual evidence, you know, uh, you can speculate all you want and no one can really say anything. So, so, um, so, you know, there was a lot of thought about maybe even like a civilization under those clouds or something like that. But yeah, no, those clouds are, um, are sulfuric acid um, they're nasty okay very nasty uh, as I mentioned before the atmosphere is 92 times thicker than the earth's atmosphere that's 93,000 millibars if, if I give it to you in a unit that you would probably be a little more familiar with that's about 1,300 pounds per square inch so yeah um, the atmosphere is nasty because it's volcanic Venus is covered in volcanoes. Uh, you can't just see through the clouds, but radar mapping can see through the clouds. And if you look at the actual surface of Venus, it looks like this. And all the dark areas here, and some of the light colored areas, are volcanoes. Uh, so it's covered with volcanoes. So, so that atmosphere is volcanic um, in nature, uh, which means it also has a lot of carbon dioxide, an awful lot of carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide on the Earth is the chemical that is driving global climate change because we keep adding about 70 million tons of it per year uh, to the atmosphere. And when you add more heat trapping gas to the air, oddly enough, the air gets warmer. Um, Venus has this going on like crazy. It's 90 something percent carbon dioxide. The Earth, by the way, is a little less than one half of one percent 
but it's the rate that it's rising. It'll be over. It's 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 rising. But anyway, um, mostly carbon dioxide, ninety something percent carbon dioxide. So consequently, nine hundred degrees Fahrenheit all the time, night, day, summer, winter, doesn't matter. It's nine hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so, um, um, if it was about a hundred degrees hotter, uh, it would melt the rock. Uh, you would have a, a magma planet or lava planet or something like that. It would be very, very strange. Um, <clears throat> because Venus is covered in volcanoes, that means that the interior of it is still uh, has liquid rock down there. It's still molten, which means that it should have really strong plate tectonic forces, but it doesn't. It has very, very weak plate tectonic forces. Not It doesn't really have plate tectonics, not the way the Earth does. Um, and so you, you get Venus quakes, you get things moving around down there, but it doesn't have the nice active, what we call a Wilson cycle, uh, that the Earth has. Um, and that's a really interesting problem because it really should. Uh, but for whatever reason, it doesn't, and we don't really understand why it doesn't, but it doesn't. Um, another thing we don't really understand, I'll go back to the bullet points here real quick, um, is how the atmosphere on Venus went in one direction, and the atmosphere on the Earth went in an entirely different direction. Um, the Earth's atmosphere uh, began as primarily volcanic as well, uh, but we kind of went in a whole other direction than Venus did, and so why that happened and, um, is a really interesting question that we honestly don't have um, a very good answer to. Uh, the other thing about Venus is it spins backward. Um, everything spins counterclockwise as viewed from above uh, the North Pole of the Earth. Uh, Venus spins clockwise. Um, not sure why. But it does. You don't even want to know what that does for a solar and a side row day. That's just weird. But um, but it does. It spins. It spins clockwise, which is uh, really rather odd. So um, we never landed anything on Venus. We being America, but the Russians did back in 1976. Uh, they landed a couple things on Venus. Um, now they, they they lasted for about 20 minutes and then they died. Uh, not people, just rovers. The only places people have walked have been the Earth and our Moon. Um, well, rovers and or, or landers, sorry, not rovers. But uh, this is what the servers of Venus looks like. Here, they landed another one on the side of a volcano. Uh, looks like that, uh, which is you know looks like mafic igneous rock, basalt, or gabbro, which is about what you expect on a planet. Planets mo mostly begin with that kind of rock, the kind of rock that makes up the sea floor in the Hawaiian Islands, and then they gradually develop different kinds of rock from that rock and so that that's about what you would expect but it's still really really fascinating it's it's, it's very interesting um and so um and so yeah so uh so venus is not not nearly the haven for life that we once thought it was 900 degrees fahrenheit um you know 1300 pounds per square inch sulfuric acid in the atmosphere uh, not you know yeah that that's tough that's really really tough um, and so uh, we do have some plans for some things uh, having to do with Venus not gonna land there because you just land there and your instruments die um, but orbiting um, there there's there's a lot to be learned there yet and so it's it's, it's a fascinating place um, speaking of fascinating places, let's let's jump on out to the next one, and that's us, the Earth. Um, you've all seen pictures of the Earth from space, great big blue marble-y looking thing. Um, I figured I'd show you something a little bit different. Uh, this is a map of the Earth um, with a little white dot for every few thousand or hundred thousand people. Um, and so this gives you a really good idea about where the people are on the earth it also gives you uh, a really good idea that you know you can't study the earth and ignore the people there's just no way uh, we're everywhere we're, we're affecting everything these days uh, and so if you're studying the earth and you're not you know taking into account the effect that people have um, you're probably not really actually studying the earth you're doing something else you're studying some 
theoretical thing that actually doesn't exist anymore. Um, but you can see here, you know, you, you notice first of all that there's a lot more people living east of the Mississippi River than there are west of the Mississippi River in the United States. Um, you can see that, you know, Europe is just, you know, lots of people. You can see the Trans-Siberian Railroad there with little towns along the way. Uh, you can see the huge population density in India, uh, but coming to an end right at the Himalayan Mountains, right there. Um, and then so Mongolia, southern China, etc. Here, uh, lots of people in Japan. In fact, if, in fact, if you draw a circle around Japan, India, and southern China, there are more people living inside of that circle than there are outside of that circle. So as we think about the future, Asia uh, figures heavily. Um, into the future of the planet. It really truly does. Uh, you can see people following the Nile River there down into the Saharan Desert. Uh, I mean, there, there's just, I don't know, I could look at this map for, for, for hours. There's just lots of interesting stuff here. Um, this is a simulation. This is not actually light. This is just, you know, uh, a little white point for every few thousand people. Okay, here's light. So this is Florida uh, taken from space. Um, by I, I don't know space shuttle probably, but um, so so and it's just a photograph. This isn't a simulation. This is just a photograph showing the light that people make. Right? I mean, here's Pinellas County all lit up, uh, and then there's the I-4 corridor going over to Orlando, Miami, West Palm down here, uh, Sarasota, Naples, Fort Myers down here, uh, etc. There's the Everglades, which is pretty dark. Um, and then Jacksonville and you know Atlanta is going to be up in here somewhere. But anyway, um, but you get the idea. People make light, um, and astronomers call it pollution. They call it light pollution. Um, if you look up at the sky in Pinellas County at the constellation Orion, for example, it looks kind of like this. Um, there's the belt. There's the sword hanging down, shoulders, legs. Orion. Okay. Now, if all the lights go off. Uh, looks like that um, yeah a lot brighter there's a lot more stars up there than you think there are because most of them are drowned out by the ambient light now they don't get bigger that's light bleeding onto the film they don't get literally bigger uh, but they do get a lot brighter a lot brighter in fact if you look toward the center of the galaxy all the stars blend into this white strip uh, running across the sky uh, that people said looked like someone spilled milk on the sky um, and called it the Milky Way uh, which is why our galaxy has that silly name the Milky Way because uh, we realized that's what we were looking at was you know our galaxy um, and so yeah or even just I mean honestly seeing this you, you need to get away from lights the easiest way to do it around here is honestly to go out into the Gulf of Mexico on a fishing charter on a moonless night or something like that. I mean, if you just get out in the ocean at night, it generally looks like that. Uh, and that's nothing fancy. That's just point of the you know, cell phone at the sky and take a picture at night. Um, and it looks like that. It really is just incredible. I really encourage you to get away from urban areas and check it out. Um, I've seen this in, you know, West Texas, Nevada, West Virginia, um, Montana, um, you know, <coughs> anywhere where you know you're just you're just away from urban lights. Um, you can see this, and it really is amazing. Um, here's a bullet point for the Earth, just um, just to have them uh, to compare to the other planets. So we're about one AU from the Sun. Uh, we define what the AU is. We're not about. We are by definition on average one AU from the Sun. About 8,000 miles across. Abundant water in all three phases. Solid, liquid, and gas. Right? We are the only planet that has this. And, um, and uh, water is the only thing that does this. Everything else picks one. Right? Oxygen. It's gas. Iron. It's a solid. Um, bleach. It's a liquid. Right? I mean, everything else picks one. Water's all three. Naturally. Um, nothing else does that. It's really, well, water, we're, we're so used to water that we don't even think about it, but water is weird, y'all. Water is very weird stuff. Um, we have good, strong, well-developed plate tectonic forces. Um, we are the only plant that has that. Um, uh, we have abundant life. We are the only plant that has that. There might be some bacteria on Mars yet. We're not sure. Uh, but we're the only one that you land on. Oh my gosh, look at all the things that are alive everywhere, right? We have that. 
Uh, one of the reasons we have that is because we have a nice atmosphere, 79% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. The oxygen is coming from the life, by the way. Those things are related, um, right? The oxygen comes from plants. Uh, before there were plants, it came from bacteria. Before there were bacteria, there wasn't any oxygen. So, so, uh, so the life and the atmosphere are intimately, um, intimately related. 1,014 millibars, that's 14.7 pounds per square inch. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the Earth because frankly we're going to spend the entire rest of the semester on the Earth. Okay, so so uh, I'm not even going to put it on the test. So don't don't worry about this stuff. I just have it in your notes so that you have it in your notes. Okay, let's spend most of our time today though on Mars because Mars is proving uh, to be just fascinating. We will uh, take a look at this picture in more detail later because, as I mentioned earlier, there's a couple things on here we want to talk about. But for now, let's take a look at the bullet points. So here they are. So about one and a half AUs from the sun. Um, it's a bit smaller than the Earth, almost half the size of the Earth, about 40, 40, 4, ah, 40, 4,216 miles across versus our, our 7,900. Uh, has a very thin atmosphere. Um, mostly carbon dioxide, but a little bit of nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of argon. The oxygen is probably not biological oxygen. Seven millibars average. Um, our our atmosphere is 1,014, so about one percent of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, average temperature is negative 67, which is not warm, but it's not that bad as these things go. Um, um, we probably uh, we see negative 67 here on the earth from time to time. I have a friend who lives in uh, north central Canada and she sees negative 40 pretty regularly. So, you know, uh, so that's not ridiculous. Uh, but it is an average uh, of a high of about 81, which is not bad at all. But a low of negative, the negative sign is over here, negative 225, which is not good at all, right? There's just not that much atmosphere here to hold on to the heat. Even if it is mostly carbon dioxide, there's just not that much of it. So Mars is cold. Uh, Mars is, is, is very cold. Um, there is, um, there, the Mars does have um, ice caps, water ice caps. Um, they fooled us for a while because we thought they were carbon dioxide ice caps. Turns out that it's carbon dioxide um, covered with, um, rather, sorry, it's water covered with a layer of carbon dioxide. We now know that Mars used to have standing water. Look like that. Uh, Mars used to have oceans and rivers and lakes and things like that on it. Mars used to have standing water. Uh, Mars still has frozen water in those ice caps, but also um, in, uh, in, the, in the Martian uh, regolith. Uh, so it still has frozen water. We also know Mars used to have a magnetic field. Um, and it turns out that that magnetic field um, and, uh, and the water, the standing water, uh, are related. And they are related through Mars's atmosphere. So here's the trick. So we look at this, and we're like, okay, well, let's make that again, All right? Uh, let's you know terraform Mars or whatever. Okay, you can't terraform Mars. Stop thinking that if you do. <laughs> no, I'm sure you don't. But you know, right? There, people like to talk about Mars as if it's kind of like. I don't know, option B, and it's really not. Mars will kill you. Only a little bit slower than Venus will, but Mars will absolutely kill you. Um, um, it is not planet B. The, the very, very worst day ever on the Earth is still better than the best day on Mars. Okay, It is a very, very dangerous place. But it used to have water. You know, it used to look like that. So what happened? Because here's the thing. If you go to Mars today... And you dump a bucket of water on the surface of Mars, it's going to evaporate before it hits the ground. Okay, it's going to go away before it hits the ground. Um, so how do you keep water on the surface? Or, or maybe better yet, how did you keep? You know, how was there you know uh, water on the surface of Mars billions of years ago? Well, billions of years ago there was an atmosphere. And so, see, here's the thing. If you want to get water to evaporate, there's two ways to do it. The first way we do all the time, okay, um, heat it up, right? Heat it up, boil it, 
it evaporates, no problem. Okay. Uh, the other way, though, that we never do is lower the atmospheric pressure because that atmospheric pressure is keeping the water liquid. If you relieve that pressure, it'll turn into a gas. Okay, so in order for Mars to have water like that, it had to have had an atmosphere, and it did. And that atmosphere, billions of years ago, was protected by a magnetic field. Right? The Earth has a magnetic field. Our solid inner core and our liquid outer core, the liquid outer core going around the solid inner core, turns our planet into a giant magnet, and it would have, we have a magnetic field. It protects us from all kinds of radiation. It's a good and happy thing. Now, Mars used to have one. So what happened? So Mars has a magnetic field. It has an atmosphere. And that atmospheric pressure can keep water as a liquid on its surface things are good. So what happened? Well, remember how I said that our magnetic field is generated by a liquid outer core and a solid inner core? Mars used to have that, but it doesn't anymore. It cooled completely. And when it did cool completely, the magnetic field that was protecting the atmosphere went away. The magnetic field goes away. Now, the surface of Mars is being blasted by solar radiation. It blasts the atmosphere right off of Mars. And without the atmosphere to provide pressure, um, that, that water is just going to evaporate. Uh, and Mars, you know, and it goes away. It just evaporates up into space. And so, you know, it looks like this. And then eventually it looks like this, that dry kind of surface world that we that we all know. Uh, now, interestingly, the rover Curiosity um, uh, has has some data that, that lead us to conclude that the, the, that surface history of water on Mars is probably longer than we thought it was and might it extends uh, to... to to less than three billion years ago. So what I'm saying here is that there was liquid water on Mars less than three billion years ago. Okay, now, uh, why is that important? Well, it's important because uh, three billion years ago on the Earth, there was stuff alive in that water. Uh, there was absolutely stuff alive in that water. Now, not, not, not fish, bacteria, okay, but, but there was life on the earth. And so that brings, you know, a watery Mars within the window for life on earth. And so while we're, you know, while it may or may not be fruitful to look for current life on Mars, it is definitely fruitful to look for the chemical signatures of past life on Mars. So really, really fascinating, which is why we are paying so much attention to Mars, right? We've got two rovers on the surface, we've got orbiters, we've got all kinds of stuff on Mars. Um, and so, so yeah, Mars has two moons, Phobos and Demios. Um, I mentioned this before when we talked about uh, Jovian versus terrestrial planets. Uh, they are jaggedy, kind of little tiny asteroid looking moons in very highly inclined, very elliptical orbits. They're going to hit Mars, y'all. Okay, they're going to hit Mars. They're going to hit Mars. <laughs> um, um, they just haven't yet. So they, they, they're clearly, though, captured asteroids. Uh, which means that, you know, that, um, that the Earth is really the only terrestrial planet to have a nice, big, um, moon-looking moon. Our exploration of Mars, oh, there we go, our exploration of, Mar of Mars has been very successful lately, very successful. We're, we're learning a lot and we're having a lot of good success landing things on Mars. Um, back in the 70s, um, we landed uh, two Viking landers on Mars, learned a lot, uh, got some really good information, some really good data. Uh, and then we spent like the late 70s, the 80s, and the early 90s um, smacking spacecraft into Mars, uh, failing to land them. Uh, it was uh, it was a tough time for Mars exploration, but then in 1997, the, the people at the Jet Propulsion Lab kind of figured out how to do this, um, and they landed this little thing here, Sojourner, just a few feet across, not very big at all, um, and it could move around an area, you know, about the size of a classroom, uh, and you know, it had a little Mosenberg mass spectrometer on front of it, and it could you know go rolling up to a rock and tell you what it was made of, solar panel for 
super power and it was very very cool at the time we were like this is awesome y'all we can roll around on mars right then in 2004 NASA landed Spirit and Opportunity, uh, identical on either side of the planet. Uh, they had six months life expectancies and they lasted for years. Opportunity only stopped sending back signal a couple of years ago. Uh, not that long ago at all. Um, they just would not die. Just on and on and on. Very successful missions very successful uh, once again you can see the solar panels there um, providing power so the latest generation of rovers curiosity and curiosity's sister perseverance same basic configuration for perseverance um, curiosity landed in 2012 perseverance landed just last year in uh, 2020 um, and so um, and uh, these are these are big the, 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 you know, this is about the size of a golf cart um, this is about the size of a Ford Explorer. Uh, no solar panels, nuclear reactor for power, uh, and they just go and go and go night, day, some they just don't care. They just go and go and go. Um, but here's the trick. Getting this thing down onto the surface of Mars safely is not easy. Not easy at all, okay? Um, Sojourner, Spirit Opportunity were fairly easy. Um, parachute, to slow you down uh pop open um um uh sorry yeah pop open some airbags hit the ground bounce around a little bit right yourself deflate the airbags open the doors go rolling off right not easy nothing in space is easy but not that bad okay this will not work for something the size of a ford explorer it just won't uh this thing is too heavy uh parachute doesn't slow it down that much and if you deploy airbags it's just gonna laugh and pop them on the you know when it hits nothing you can't do it that way there is a whole procedure uh for entry descent and landing that is uh remarkable really and so i have a link to that in a video called the seven minutes of terror <laughs> okay so what i'd like you to do right now is pause this video and uh, look where you open this video and you'll see a link to seven minutes of terror open that one and watch it and then there's one after that uh, called um, 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 EDL uh, what am I going to call that? Let me think of something to call it. Let's call it. Let's call it Seven Minutes of Terror on board. There we go, um, and watch that. Okay, the first one shows you what the entry, descent, and landing procedures are for Mars for something this big, and then the second one shows you what it looks like from the point of view of the craft. They have um, not for curiosity, but for perseverance. They had cameras on that thing, filming it. Um, as it landed it is it is remarkable so go um, and watch those two videos and then come back okay you're back wasn't that crazy I know I just the first time I saw that I was just like that is insane uh, but that's what they did and they did it twice which is just just really crazy um, and so um, um, but uh, you know the end of this arm has a camera and so, you know, whenever you're in a really cool place and you just landed, uh, you know, you're, you're inclined to turn that camera up toward your head and, you know, take a selfie. And that's one of the first pictures that Curiosity sent back. Um, here's another one. Uh, I don't know. I really like these selfies. Um, Curiosity and Perseverance can both photograph all of themselves. Uh, which is really handy, right? You take a picture, you take another picture, you stitch them together, you get this. This is actually a whole bunch of pictures. Um, you can see the shadow of the arm, but you can't actually see the arm because when you stitch the pictures together, it ends up not being in the pictures. But they can photograph themselves. Um, you can also see the nuclear reactor back here a little bit better. There it actually is installed there. Um, and so, yeah, interestingly, with Curiosity, uh, the thing that's going to limit its, its life is going to be its wheel. Um, uh, they got holes in them. Um, they, they did a quick wheel redesign between Curiosity and Perseverance because they're like, hey, 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 whoa, 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 no, no, no. Uh, uh, we need better wheels. And so they, they did a quick redesign on that. But the interesting thing about pictures from Mars is not that they look alien, it's that they don't look alien, right? I mean, this is this is one of the first pictures that Curiosity sent back uh, from Gale Crater, uh, that that mountain they talked about in the in the Seven Minutes of Terror video, um, and uh, and you can see here, uh, you know, it just it looks like the Arizona desert. I mean, it really doesn't look 
all that different from the Earth. Not really. It's, it, it's really interesting. And, and the reason that the surface of Mars doesn't look that different from the surface of the Earth is because it was still formed by running water right in the case of mars billions of years ago but there's been nothing since then right and so and so it, it really is fascinating I mean, here's a bunch of sedimentary rock um if i was on that this was on the earth i'd be looking for fossils in that rock but um really just uh it just it just really is a fascinating place um the the latest the perseverance rover has a helicopter here's the president for scale it's a pretty dang big helicopter actually um uh, this is a model uh flying around on mars um here's a picture of it now martian atmosphere only one one hundredth of the earth's atmosphere right and so so you know those, those blades have to spend thirty thousand revolutions per minute uh, to get that thing in the air and it they tested it and it worked oh my gosh it worked so well i mean it just it just flew and flew and had this autonomous navigation they could just go wherever it wanted and and so you know future rover missions they can they can send helicopters uh to you know just to, to span out and and scout and find good areas to go and and you know they can move obviously a lot faster than the rover can uh and and cover a lot more ground and so it's a, it's a great great thing we, we can put helicopters on mars i mean that is just crazy i love that so much um um here's uh the largest volcano in the solar system <laughs> um, this is olympus mons on mars um uh it is eighty thousand feet tall it is huge it is several hundred miles across it is absolutely massive um um if it was uh, here here's the largest volcano above water volcano on the earth um hawaii the big island in the hawaiian islands um um if Olympus Mons was on this map, it is not just it is not just big, it is the size of the entire Hawaiian island chain. Um uh which is just 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 massively huge. Now of course that's out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, so we don't you know, we might not have that good of an idea about how big that really is. So uh so here's the thing. If it's in the United States, it's the size of Arizona. Okay, if it's in Florida it stretches from the keys to jacksonville yeah it's, it's the size of our state <laughs> okay so so it is a huge volcano right there's nothing on the earth that is even nearly that big uh i mean it's just that you know, volcanoes on the earth are you know the size of these little dots for the states right if they're even that big that would be a huge one i mean they're just they're just tiny compared to this so really and you know how you make a volcano that big is a really interesting question uh that we'll talk about later on but it's a it's a it's a fascinating thing really here's a picture of the ice caps uh once again this is carbon dioxide ice covering the water ice um so there there most definitely is water left on mars uh, we don't know yet if there's any liquid water maybe in the subsurface uh but we definitely know there's ice um along with the volcanoes here's here's olympus mons right here here's another really big volcano here's another really big volcano there's also a really big valley on mars the valles marineris right there if that was in the united states it would stretch from the east coast to the west coast it would be the size of our country across um it is a tectonic valley it is where mars tried to have plate tectonics but failed okay and so um and so it went as far as ripping a uh, a tear in its surface and then it just stopped so why it stopped we don't know why mars never i mean we understand why mars doesn't have plate tectonics now it's mostly cooled completely in the interior so there's no convection of rock down there to get the get the crust to move but um but we we don't know why it wouldn't go back then because it seems like it should have but it didn't so um, interestingly, I just want to do this really quick, but there is a hint of methane on Mars. Um, um, now, now this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten points. So let's not get you know too excited here, okay? But it's interesting because methane comes from life. Methane, you know, comes from cows, right? uh, both ends, um, but also from bacteria, from any, any number of organic processes. And if we look at this carefully, 
uh, we can see that there is kind of a seasonal pattern where there's more of it in the summer and then less of it in the winter that points a bit bit off so eh, once again not a lot of data here huge error bars so massive huge grain of salt but still it's interesting it is interesting now uh, there aren't any cows on Mars uh, here's my cow spaceman which I mostly just use this to show because that's just a really fun picture but no so where's the methane coming from well there's two possibilities one of them is that it's organic one of them is that there's microbes in the subsurface right releasing methane and in the you know summer um, this this subsurface water if there is any turns to liquid and the microbes become active and they release the methane um and then in the winter when the water freezes the microbes become dormant don't release the methane uh so that that would be that would be a thing uh what's also possible though is that it is just the weathering of the mineral olivine in the subsurface which will also release methane um, and that would weather also when the water is liquid and then it would stop weathering it when the water is um is uh solid so so there's a there's a kind of a normal chemical weathering answer to why that methane is there and then there's a really interesting biological one too right and we don't know <laughs> we, we don't know but it is it is fascinating uh when you think about it one more thing uh one more very cool thing and this is mars insight this is a lander this is here it is being built at the jet propulsion lab division of nasa um here's an artist rendering of what it would look like on the surface of mars and here it is on the surface of mars um uh and the fun thing about insight is insight has a seismograph uh it has a mars quake detector right this is how you study the interiors of rocky bodies is by looking at how you know mars quake or earthquake or moon quake waves propagate and travel through these rocky bodies that's how you study them i uh, will talk about this a little bit when we talk about earthquakes but for now we got a seismograph on mars y'all and it is picking up mars quakes it is um mostly from impact but it is and so uh and every time it gets one we learn a little bit more um they just released a whole batch of papers um i've got the i've got the issue of science that has them in it uh it's uh, releasing some of the analyses of this stuff and so we're learning about the interior of mars uh, from insight which was always the plan um and so here are the uh here are the terrestrial planets right uh shown uh not not distance wise but we know that by now surely uh but size wise right so mercury venus the surface of venus not the cloudy portion earth and mars um and so with a sunset on mars taken by opportunity uh, next time, we will move out to Jupiter and the Jovian planets, okay? Alrighty, y'all tune back in for the Jovian planets later on, and I'll talk with you later. Take care. Bye-bye.